same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O Virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. The planter shall plant, and shall eat them as common things. For there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion, unto the Lord our God. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that traveleth with child together. A great company shall return hither. They shall come with weeping and with supplications. Will I lead them? I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him, as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore shall they come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat, and for wine, and for oil, and for the young of the flock and of the herd, and their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy, and will comfort them, and make them rejoice from their sorrow. And I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, said the Lord. And reading from verse 31. Behold, the day is come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, said the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, said the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more.
3 and verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 14. Turn, O backsliding children, said the Lord, for I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And our subject is the Christian era in the prophecies of Jeremiah. I'm not sure whether we can cover all the messianic prophecies in Jeremiah or Christian era prophecies, but we'll look at a number because uh, uh, one thinks of the book of the prophet Jeremiah as an essentially gloomy book, a book of tragedy, a book which predicts, which prophesies terrible things to happen to Judah in particular. But it also has great prophecies of restoration and God dealing with a remnant and bringing them back to their land. And in turn, a future remnant, not just of Israel, but of all Gentiles coming into a great kingdom, the kingdom of the branch, the Lord our righteousness, names of Christ, all here in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Now we retrace our steps just a little. This is the only passage we shall look at this evening, which we've already broadly covered before for a different purpose, <coughs> and then we'll be going right into the middle and the, towards the end of the book, just gleaning those passages which speak of Christ or the Christian era. And here in verse 14, you get the first indication of a remnant, and that is that people will be taken, a remnant will be restored, one of a city and two of a family. A family being the Hebrew word that describes a clan as well as a family or even a district. And that is clearly the sense because it's to be coupled with one of a city and two of an entire clan. That's a very small portion. Whereas Isaiah in his ministry was told that he would be ministering to a tenth, very likely a symbolic tenth. The proportion here appears to be even smaller. And so it was. The number of uh, people of Judah who were taken into captivity in the future, into Babylon, the number that came back was far less than a tenth of those who were taken captive. The remnant was quite small. And here you've got two levels of prophecy operating. First of all, in verse 14, the one of a city, two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. There's going to be a literal fulfillment in the release of a remnant of people of Judah from Babylonian captivity. But as we shall see in these passages, they are not entirely fulfilled with the release of a remnant back to Judah from Babylonian captivity. There are things said in these chapters that were never fulfilled then. They were just, well, a kind of foreshadowing of something even greater when a great remnant, not only of Jews, but of Gentiles also, we're told as the book goes on, will be brought out to a permanent state of blessing to a state of blessing that shall never be taken away. Well, those kind of things were certainly not true of the remnant who returned to Judah from Babylon, because although they were restored in a political way, and they knew also much spiritual blessing, it didn't last. They too, in turn, became disobedient, and a remnant was taken out of them. And then there was greater disobedience. Then there were dark days, through the intertestamental period of a, around 400 years before the coming of Christ. And then was the ministry of Christ in the New Testament era, when another remnant was brought out, not only of Jews, but of Gentiles, people who were truly saved, people who were brought into a relationship with God through salvation in Christ Jesus, a salvation that would never be taken away. And you could say that there was a third level of prophecy in many of these prophecies also, because they speak of the final gathering in 
when Christ shall come again and take his people and gather them together for eternal glory and bliss. And that is how Old Testament prophecy works. So just look at the verses that follow verse 14 and verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now that to a degree was fulfilled, as we've been seeing from recent studies in uh, Nehemiah. That was fulfilled even with those who returned to Judah from captivity. First under Ezra, the temple was rebuilt, and then the walls were restored under the governor Nehemiah. And during that time, we read of worship being restored, and we read of people, Levites, who were capable and spiritual enough to teach the word of God. So there were some shepherds and some spiritual people. So it was in measure fulfilled, even with the physical return of a remnant of the people of Judah to Judah after the captivity, but not for long and not entirely fulfilled. This is fulfilled most completely in the New Testament age, at the time of Christ and with the formation of the Church of Christ. I will give you pastors this hints at the end of the Levitical priesthood. According to my heart, save men, which shall feed you with knowledge, and not only knowledge, but understanding. And it's not put here just as a synonym, it's put here to indicate that they'll know things about grace and about salvation, and they'll also personally understand them and experience them. That's the sense of verse 15. And then in verse 16, when this age comes, and this wasn't fulfilled with the return of the Jews from Babylonian captivity, this is entirely for the Church of Christ. It shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, said the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Why so much was made of the ark of the covenant, which resided in the holy place, the holy of holies, which contained the law, and which had the mercy seat and the symbols of mercy. Well, you won't talk about the Ark of the Covenant constantly in the new era, says the prophecy of Jeremiah. Neither shall it come to mind. Well, I suppose in the Christian era, it comes to mind to a small extent, but it's not a central feature in our worship. Symbols are done away with, because now we have Christ, who was represented by the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat over the Ark, the symbols of mercy. We don't need symbols anymore, because we have Christ. So the prophecy is fulfilled. Our worship doesn't center on those things, or focus on those things anymore. They're interesting to us, of course, but they're no longer parts of our worship. Neither shall that be done anymore. The entire Old Testament order will be done away with. And so you see, some elements of this could be said to be fulfilled literally when the captives returned to Judah. But other elements of it, of the prophecy, most certainly weren't fulfilled then. They waited for Christ, and then the prophecy is entirely fulfilled. Verse 17, at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it into the name of the Lord. Now, that is an extraordinary prophecy, and it's obvious that it cannot be taken literally, because all the nations cannot be gathered into Jerusalem, nor were all the nations gathered into Jerusalem. There would be certainly people who would go to Jerusalem, but all the nations look to Jerusalem in the sense that that is the place of Calvary. That is the place we focus on. Christ there outside Jerusalem was offered up for our sins. That's the place of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so it is in a sense the focal point of the worship of all the saved Gentiles. And the end of verse 17, 
neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil hearts. There will be a great revival of sincere faith and sincere religion. But look at verse 18. These are extraordinary prophecies. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. Well, that wasn't fulfilled with the return of the captains, the captives, the remnant after the Babylonian captivity. The house of Israel, as a house, was never restored. The northern kingdom, remember, that had gone into captivity earlier with the fall of Samaria, they were never restored historically in the Old Testament. And yet Jeremiah speaks repeatedly of the day coming when Israel and Judah will be one again and worshipping the Lord. Well, if that wasn't fulfilled with the return of the captives, when was it fulfilled? Well, in a sense, with the coming of Christ. Because in the kingdom of Christ, the Judeans and Israelites and Gentiles are all converted. There are Christians drawn from all nations, all nationalities. So in a sense, Israel and Judah are literally united again in the converts to Jesus Christ through the history of the Christian church. But then the prophecy is also figurative because the uniting of Israel and Judah embraces even the Gentiles. They create a unity of all God's true people the international Jewish Gentile Church of Jesus Christ. And that is what the prophecy points to. There will be a time when all the people of God will be united in their worship of the Lord. And so, uh, uh, verse 19, But I said, How shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage? And then, uh, then I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shall not turn away from me. It's coming at a time when there'll be people who turn to the Lord as individuals and remain with him. The perseverance of the saints, saved always to be saved. So there are some verses in chapter 3, and I'd like to go on now to chapter 16, and here are some more verses which are predictive of the New Testament age. I was asked once many years ago why there is no Isaiah 53 in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. This is just a little aside. Why Isaiah was so much earlier. And yet he was given to see Christ hanging on the cross of Calvary. He was given to see a dying, suffering, atoning Saviour. Why does that not come into Jeremiah? It seems from that point of view that Jeremiah takes a step backward. He's almost pre-Isaiah, which he isn't, of course. And the only answer we can give, because Jeremiah was clearly familiar with the prophecy of Isaiah so many years before him, he was clearly familiar with that, but because he quotes from it, he repeats the branch, the Lord our righteousness, and so on. He uses the same words, Isaiah's words, in his prophecy. He was given them from God for himself, but he casts his prophecy by inspiration in some of the very words that Isaiah used before him. So why doesn't he pick up Isaiah 53? And the answer we suggest is this, because the times in which they were prophesying were so different. In the time of Isaiah, Isaiah was inspired to tell his generation some very wonderful things about Christ. Jeremiah prophesied in a conspicuously evil time. Jeremiah prophesied in a time when, in spite of the reforms of King Josiah, the people were hypocrites. They would worship, but they were still idolaters, extreme idolaters. And there seems to be a veiling of some of the more precious things in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Some things he does not reveal, as Isaiah did before him. He goes a long way. He talks of the new age and its characteristics, 
but he talks much more about it being founded on the condition of repentance. This will require, will be for those who are truly repentant souls. And that's his repeated emphasis. Though he says a great deal about the church, he doesn't touch, he doesn't cast pearls before swine, as it were. He doesn't say some of the more sensitive things, such as Isaiah did. And I think there's little doubt it's due to the antagonistic spiritual attitude of his generation. They were not to be privileged with those things, though they had already been revealed. But let me take you to chapter 16 and verse 19. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. So there is this great address to God. And the old writers used to say, here is a veiled address to Christ the Redeemer. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge. Why does Jeremiah require those things? Well, he requires them spiritually, as we do, a representative someone who stands in our place, who is our refuge from the storm of judgment and has taken our condemnation and our punishment. But it's a prophecy fundamentally about the time when the Gentiles shall come, just as Isaiah had. Surely the Gentiles will say, our entire tradition and the beliefs of our fathers and our culture is nothing but lies and vanity and things wherein there is no profit. Shall a man make gods unto himself, and they are no gods? And there is a comment about the calling of the Gentiles in the New Testament era. Verse 21, Therefore, behold, when this time comes, I will this once cause them to know, I will cause them to know my hand, my handiwork, They'll understand it in conversion perhaps, <coughs> in the remaking of the character of the soul and my might, my power, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. So they'll know the character of God, the name of God, representing his attributes. So there's a prophecy of the Christian era without any doubt. Then look on to chapter 23, and we go fairly rapidly. But these things are tremendous uh, predictions. And I read from verse 3 of chapter 23. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds, shepherds again, a new ministry, not the typical Levitical priesthood, I will set up shepherds over them and care for them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, they'll have absolute security, nor be dismayed, which you could uh, translate as defeated or hurt, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking. They'll have nothing lacking of all that they need, said the Lord. Now we can stay with that verse for a moment. Shepherds, security, victory over their enemies, and plenteous provision. <coughs> now, all those things were certainly not fulfilled when the captives returned from the Babylonian captivity. There was much insecurity. It went on for a long time. Though God was with them, they had to defend themselves repeatedly. They had a long, long period of difficulty, and then, of course, Things got worse and worse, and uh, then there was the intertestamental period. So these things were not fully fulfilled. There was a token fulfillment with the physical release of, and return of a remnant of the captain, captives. But fearing no more, not being dismayed, not lacking anything, those promises are spiritually fulfilled in the redeemed in the Church of Christ. They're our promises, and they're fulfilled perfectly 
spiritually. Whatever happens to us physically, we are secure in salvation. Our salvation can never be taken from us. We are never dismayed, defeated. We may backslide, we may fall, but we will not be defeated by the enemy of souls. And there will always be a witnessing church. And even should the last days of this earth before Christ comes be days of intense hostility and persecution, there will always be the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that is the sense in which Zion will be protected and the prophecy will be fulfilled. Now go on to verse 9. And it's perfectly obvious that these words are being fulfilled spiritually in New Testament days. Behold, the day is come, said the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. The righteous branch. Why branch? You notice our translators have given them capital B, and of course they should. Jeremiah is inspired here to take up Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 2. The branch, the prophecy of the branch. Why should Christ be called a branch? Well, you know that in the book of Genesis and in other Old Testament books, a branch was the term often used in the Hebrew for a representative, a king's representative, a special person's representative was that person's branch. That's probably one reason why a name of Christ in prophecy is the branch. He's the representative of the Godhead, the representative of the Father and of the Holy Spirit come down to earth for us. But also, of course, it uh, signifies his descent, according to prophecy, from King David. He's in the line of David. He's a branch that can be traced back to a particular tree, the tree of David. And the uh, descendant who was promised of David has come. I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper. Christ clearly, the branch of David, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In what sense does Christ execute judgment and justice in the earth? Judgment, righteousness, same thing in the use in, the, in their use in the Old Testament, and you could render it that way, shall execute righteousness and justice. Well, that's the twofold work of Christ, isn't it? Christ came and offered up his perfect obedience, his perfections, his infinite righteousness to deserve and earn and secure salvation and heaven for all his people. And he went to Calvary to suffer an atoning death to satisfy the justice of God so that sin was a twofold. It's the twofold work of Christ, and fittingly predicted in that uh, fifth verse, chapter 23, the righteous branch, the king, shall execute judgment and justice. And of course, at the end of the age, he shall be the judge and execute both judgment and justice in that sense also. Verse 6, in his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. Now this is a theme in Jeremiah, and he refers to this repeatedly. Judah and Israel being together. And the first time they're ever together is in the New Testament church, where there'll be saved people who are descended from Israel, and saved people who are descended from Judah. And only by converts in the church are people, are those two tribes represented as united together. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called that wonderful name, the Lord, our righteousness. So there is clearly a prediction of Christ and the Christian era linked with verse 4, the shepherds. And always the righteous shepherds of Jeremiah constantly being predicted are linked with Christ 
and the coming of the Messiah. Now turn on to chapter, uh, let's go on to, I can't do everything I was going to do, I'm going to overtake one or two, and come down to chapter 30. And in chapter 30, I shall read verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, first of all the yoke of Babylon, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. They're going to go into captivity, but already Jeremiah is predicting they're coming out of it, as 70 years later they did. Verse 9, the remnant anyway. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. So now it's clear what Jeremiah's method is. Should you think that he is only speaking about the <coughs> physical release of a remnant of the people of Judah from Babylon, he ties the prophecy in straight away with one of David their king, whom I will raise up unto them in the future. But well, that's Christ. The Messiah is promised as a descendant of David. He is the future king. He is the one to whom they look. So, yes, the prophecy does include the literal return of the remnant of the captives, but it immediately goes on to show that the real objective of the prophecy, the real point it's focusing on, is the coming of Christ. Then it will, the prophecies will be entirely fulfilled. Verse 10, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, said the Lord, Neither be dismayed of Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed, your descendants, from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and be in rest, and so on. And so there are prophecies of security in their release. Then if you look down to verse 17 of that same chapter, there are more prophecies of restoration. I will restore health unto thee, I will heal thee of thy wounds, said the Lord because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after, but I'll bring you back, and a remnant were brought back from captivity, but they were only a sign of what would come in the future, an even greater deliverance with the coming of Christ. And I could go to more verses in that glorious chapter, but look on to chapter 31. <coughs> And verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him, as a shepherd doth his flock. It's poetic. It seems to be a cry, not to the Gentile nations of those days, but those in the future, announcing poetically the coming <coughs> of the period of the Gentiles. Verse 11, For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him. This is as near as, as Jeremiah comes to repeating Isaiah 53. He doesn't talk about the suffering servant and his suffering for our sins and atoning for us, but he does talk about redemption and ransom, a purchase price being paid for those who are saved. So that's as near as Jeremiah comes to the language of atonement. A ransom <coughs> paid, a redemption price, to purchase people back from their captivity and their condemnation. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the, of the Lord. And so the passage goes on. But I'm going to take you down to verse 15, perhaps, no, verse 22, for want of time. How long wilt thou go about 
O thou backsliding daughter, for the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth, a woman shall compass a man. One of the most mysterious verses of the Bible. It is, we believe, a prophecy of the coming of Christ. But it's in very veiled terms because it was such an evil generation. It is veiled from the eyes of the masses <coughs> and it is accessible only to believers. Jeremiah is quite guarded in his prophecies, but there's only one thing you can make of these words, and that is the coming of Christ. There are two general ways among the old writers of interpreting it. Here is a new thing in the earth, something that has never happened before. Something unique will happen. That's how it's announced. A woman shall compass a man. Some people, but this is not the favorite interpretation, say it's the virgin birth. From a woman shall come a man, a special man. This is a unique thing. is isn't, it isn't any ordinary birth. The more popular of the interpretations in the past was this, that out of the church, the descendant of David, out of the church shall come the Messiah, a unique man. So the two interpretations are that the woman is the church. Well, we're familiar with that picture in the book of Revelation. The church brings forth the man-child. He is the seed of Abraham. He comes from the uh, succession of David. Or the idea of the virgin birth from a single woman comes a man. But it's a unique event. There is a special person coming. A messianic prophecy in one form or another without doubt. And verse 23 follows. <coughs> Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as yet they shall use this speech when it comes. They shall use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities thereof. When I shall bring again their captivity, the Lord bless thee, O habitation of justice and mountain of holiness. In other words, the faithful, when Christ comes, shall say, what a privileged place is this land to have the Messiah, the mountain of holiness, the Lord of righteousness. And then there are blessings for the satisfying, verse 25, of the weary soul. And I have replenished every sorrowful soul as the faithful few sighing for the Saviour. And they are satisfied. And they are replenished. And then the extraordinary comment in verse 26, Upon this I awaked, and beheld, and my sleep was sweet unto me. Jeremiah doesn't usually say anything like that. He's heard an extraordinary thing from God. He introduced it by saying it was unique. He concludes it by saying his sleep was sweet unto him. He'd seen the Lord. He'd seen the promise of Messiah, but it's very carefully put in a very veiled way. It's for the faithful. And then the prophecy proceeds to speak of restoration and recovery. So they're secret words. They're for the elect. But this chapter is a great chapter. We come down just a few verses later to verse 31. And you're familiar with these words. Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And in the New Testament, and we've been looking at it in recent weeks, in the letter to the Hebrews, where these very words are quoted, and they're referred to the New Testament covenant. The new order of the Christian church. Behold, the day is come, and you can see it, it's obvious. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, the Sinaitic covenant, when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, 
This is quite different. That was a national covenant. <coughs> that was really a works covenant. But this is a covenant of grace. They broke their covenant for all that I did for them. But verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Notice this, house of Israel, house of Israel. Yet we're told quite clearly in the New Testament that this is the Christian covenant, the church age, the New Testament covenant. So we learn that when the Old Testament is referring to the New Testament church, it frequently uses the language of Israel. It's the house of Israel. It's described it. But it isn't the house of Israel, is it? It's the Jewish Gentile Church of Christ. Jews and Gentiles. There's no barrier, no division. The Gentiles are in the same body and the same church. The covenant is made with us. I will make with the house of Israel the Zion of the future, Jews and Gentiles, I will put my law in their inward parts. This is inward conversion. This is religion of the heart. And write it in their hearts. And will be their God and they shall be my people. And listen to this. Now we even have a detail of the New Testament church. It won't be like the Old Testament church. Saints and sinners all mixed together. A nation. <coughs> It'll be the redeemed. It'll have, so far as we can ensure, a regenerate church membership. Verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, said the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And that will stand forever. So, these prophecies have, I repeat once again, a physical aspect in that the a remnant of the Babylonian captives returned to Judah, but the prophecies are not entirely fulfilled until you come to the Church of Christ, inward spiritual conversion. Of course, individuals among the Jews were truly converted and found the Lord. But the prophecy is not entirely fulfilled till you come to the church. And it isn't super entirely fulfilled until you all get to heaven. So there are the three layers of prophecy. You see how this heavenly part works here. Verse 34, and they shall teach no man, every man his neighbor. This is truest of all in heaven. We are regenerate church but we can't guarantee that every member is truly saved we hope so they said they were but we can't be sure but in heaven we shall be sure and the perfect and complete fulfillment of the prophecy will be there <coughs> they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the lord for they shall all know me of course we will in heaven there will be no phony converts left, left into heaven, only the same. So, these are wonderful prophecies, and they tell us much and remind us of the great things of the Church of Christ. And then I go to chapter 32, and now we're just coming to conclusion. We've got just a, a little more to do. I beg your pardon, I'll go to chapter 33 and verse 6. Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them, and reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. Now, the Chaldeans are going to be destroyed, says the chapter, and the people of God, or a remnant of them, will have health and cure, and the abundance of peace and truth, in a measure fulfilled with the release of the captives, the provision of Ezra and Nehemiah, the rebuilding of temple and wall, the reinstitution of worship, many genuine people, but it wasn't entirely fulfilled, the richness of these promises until the coming of Christ. And uh, 
the way that the people have rebuilt in the Church of Jesus Christ. And verse 8, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth. Now you see witness to the Gentiles. That didn't happen with the return of the captives. All nations which shall hear all the good that I do unto them, and they shall fear and tremble like Felix for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Thus said the Lord, and so it proceeds. Great prophecies and great promises. The voice of joy, verse 11, the voice of gladness, voice of the bridegroom. We know these things most fully in the Church of Christ and super fully in the eternal glory when we're gathered in finally the final <coughs> gathering of God's people. Let me read from verse 14 of chapter 33. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and unto the house of Judah in those days, and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those, that's Christ, obviously. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. For thus said the Lord David, shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. And then neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings. Now this obviously applies now to the ministers of the New Testament and the ministry of the New Testament, though it's cast in Old Testament language. It seems to me only a short time ago we were studying the prophet Isaiah, but maybe it's a couple of years. Time does fly. And I do remember telling you the old story which illustrates the language of prophecy and the way it works. And I hope everybody understands this. So if you're familiar with this, forgive me if I repeat it. The language of prophecy in the Old Testament is cast in Old Testament terms, even though it will be fulfilled in New Testament terms. For example, when a conflict is spoken of, for years ahead in New Testament times, the language of bows and arrows and spears and shields is used. But the conflicts in the future won't be fought with bows and arrows. They'll be fought with weapons unknown to the prophets of that time. So their prophecies were expressed in the language of their time. And so it is this prophecy about the Levitical priests being saved and wonderful and nourishing the people. It refers to the New Testament ministers, but it's using Jewish language. That's inevitable. And the story is this. It is of a rich farmer, and the story is actually set in Ireland, who years and years ago said to his son, my boy, when you, as you grow up, if you never smoke, when you go through teenage and you never smoke, then on your 21st birthday, I will give you a horse and a buggy. And uh, the boy never smoked. Whether he remembered the promise of his childhood, I'm not sure. <coughs> Evidently he did. He got up on his 21st birthday and he parted the curtains of his bedroom and there parked on the drive outside the farmhouse was a Nash sedan. Those of you who know anything about which we're going back a few years, even with my illustration. But that was a very splendid motor car in the early days of motor cars. Well, we know what the son did not do. He did not rush down to his father and say, Dad, you have not kept your promise. You promised me a horse and buggy. 
That is not a fulfillment of the promise. You'd have been crazy. Of course, the promise was made in the era of horses and buggies. But since that time, along had come the motor car. And it was fulfilled in the era of the motor car. And so it is with Old Testament prophecy. The prophets speak in Jewish language. The promises are fulfilled in Jewish Gentile language and spiritual language. So we do often see things which confuse us. When the promises seem to be all about the Jews, <coughs> and it's quite clear, because they're speaking of Christ and the New Age at the same time, that not all the terms are to be taken literally. The promise is fulfilled in a new era, in a new way. And this is an example in this chapter. Well, I'm going to take you to close. I'd like to talk about a number of other things, but I must keep faith with you. You've been so patient going through this kind of study. And in chapter 50 and verse 17, this will be our last quotation. Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven away. First the king of Assyria hath devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land, as I have punished the king of Assyria. And I will bring Israel again to his habitation, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied upon Mount Ephraim. In those days, and in that time, said the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. And it follows the blood-curdling statements of the overthrow of Babylon. Now that prophecy is obviously a prophecy of the church age. It goes too far to speak of the Jews. Israel was never restored. And Judah, only a remnant, was restored. And to speak of all their sins being totally blotted out and forgiven once for all would be excessive. Because although they returned and there was a measure of restoration, the prophecies are not entirely fulfilled until the coming of Christ and Calvary and the wiping away of the sins of God's people. But isn't it interesting that Jeremiah spends so much time on the destruction of Babylon when it comes to the book of Revelation, you discover the significance that Babylon is a type of the world that will be destroyed at the end of time. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven. This is Revelation 18. I'm sure you were aware of that. Having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. The fall of Babylon took place literally, and it also was a foreshadowing of the very end of time and the destruction of the society and culture and evil of this vain world and all the things that drive it. So there are just some of the prophecies and the predictions of the era of Christ and the Christian age in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. I do hope that would have been of help to you in coming across them. Let's close this evening singing the hymn 571. Hymn 571. We've been commenting much on security, the promises of security. Well, here's a hymn based on Romans chapter 8, verses 33 to 39. Who shall the Lord's elect condemn? A paraphrase of those verses. Thank you.